Today we're going to learn a new approach to the basic Highland bagpipe scale. Stay tuned. Well, hello everybody. I'm Matt Willis Bagpiper, and on this channel I make videos to make you a stronger and more confident bagpiper. If you like this kind of content, please like the video, subscribe to the channel, comment below with any thoughts you have, share it with any other pipers in your life, and I also give Skype lessons if you want more personalized instruction. Now, on with the video. There are links below to PDF downloads of the material that we'll be using today. While editing this video, I realized it was a bit long and I'm turning it into two parts, but that worked out for the best because in having to redo the worksheets here, I realized that I could do a much better job of presenting the material. So I have a improved fingering chart and I have a new approach here that involves a fingering chart, the letter names of the notes, as well as how they look on the scale. So I'm very pleased with this material, but understand as you're watching the video, what you'll see on the music stand behind me doesn't look quite like this. The scale where we all start. We get our chanter, we have a scale. And how do we typically go about it? We start on low G, which is our bottom note for those that don't know, and we just work up one note at a time until we get to high A. It seems pretty easy and fairly straightforward. I'm not sure, however, it's the best way to go about learning the scale for the beginner. Recently, I've started trying to teach my seven-year-old son, Court, to play the pipes, but he was getting very frustrated when he got to B to C. He could get the low G out within a few minutes, and that was great, and then G, A, and B were all fine. But then, like everybody else, I went just straight to C. It involves a cross, and he's only seven. That's a lot of dexterity for a young person. And I was thinking, maybe that's not the best way to go about this anyway. There's a lot of notes that we can learn without having to worry about crossing or switching our fingers, which is when we lift one and lower another. There has to be a better way. And I think I came up with one. In this new approach, we isolate all of the note changes we can make with just the lifting and lowering of fingers without having to switch, without having one come down while another is coming up and vice versa. And to do that, we're going to start with just low G, A, and B. We're going to add C and D. And then we're going to go to the transitions we can do between low A and the top hand notes and low G and the top hand notes. And until we have those solid and under control, I'm not going to worry about trying to make the crosses. Then when we get to the crosses, which again is a point where fingers are coming up while other fingers are coming down. So for those that do know, if you're on low A, going to C, we're having to lift some fingers while bringing another one down. That's an awful lot more complicated and something that I don't know that especially a younger beginner or maybe an older beginner should have to wrap their brains around on their third note change. Maybe that should come a little bit later. A lot of people who are watching this probably already know the basic scale, and I appreciate you watching the video. If you're an instructor, you are welcome to download this and use this with your students, and please let me know how it works for you. I'm just trying to come up with a better way to have more success for the beginning pipers in this world to wrap their fingers around what is otherwise kind of a complicated system of fingering. So on this new sheet, you can see that I have the staff notation of the notes, I have the letter name written underneath, as well as the fingering you'll use for that note. It's a lot to take in, but all of these things are related. When we're playing a low G, that's what it looks like on the staff. That's how we finger it. But notice I don't write low G or low A or high G or high A. I want, as you're reading this, I want you to consistently be looking up and referring to where the note is landing on the staff. I strongly encourage all who can to learn how to read the sheet music without writing in letter names. Now for the beginner, I totally understand. We're learning a new language and it's going to take some time. But as we move on through this system, we're going to start trying to wean ourselves off of having to do that. I'm helping you out right here. And as this series, The Basics, goes on, I'll let you know when I feel strongly that you should be really trying to just look at the sheet music and read it from the staff notation alone. If you can read staff notation, there are dozens, if not hundreds, of great bagpipe tune books that have amazing melodies. And if you can read it, you can play any of them. If you can read it, you can play any of them. And I have another series about how you can go about wrapping your voice around them so you can get the proper rhythms and everything else, but it involves you being able to break down the staff notation. It's very important. To begin with, we have low G, A, and B. I do feel quite strongly that I do want my beginners to be able to cover and get a good solid low G before we do anything else. I've tried to have beginners not worry about their bottom hand and just worry about closing the top hand fingers. And I haven't had a lot of success with that. Yes, they might be able to close the top hand fingers alone, like just thumb and then pointer and then middle. 
but they often struggle later because they haven't learned the proper fingerings from the beginning. So rather than having to relearn, I spend some time making sure that we get a good solid low G. I'm gonna have a video, it'll be linked in a card up here when it's ready, about how I go about teaching a beginner to actually put their fingers on a practice channel. That's coming up. I do feel strongly that we do need to get a good solid low G before we can start anything else. So make sure, if you're a beginner, that you can get a good solid low G. And if you're an instructor, make sure that your students are getting a good solid low G before moving on with any of the rest of these exercises. Assuming you can get that good solid low G, we're ready to kind of dive in. Now I have a metronome ready, but if you're just starting a tempo, keeping a strict meter is not something I'm looking for yet. We only have two tools on our instrument to make music. We have to be able to change pitch and we have to be able to change rhythm, which is how long and short we're holding a note against the beat. In the case of learning a new scale, however, Right now, this is really the point where we're needing to focus on the pitch. So for the beginner, I don't necessarily recommend a metronome. However, for today and what I'm gonna show, I am gonna have a metronome so that you can hear a good solid rhythm wrapped around this. But if you're a beginner, just use these exercises and spend as much time as you need on any given note to make sure that you're making these note changes cleanly. So to begin with, we're gonna start on low G, we're gonna go up to A and back down to low G. Then we're gonna just raise up one more finger, start on A, Go up to B and then down back to A. And then finally in bar three, we're going to start on low G and we're going to skip the A and go to the B and then back to the low G. To do that, we're gonna wanna really make sure that we don't get a run when we're on low G, which is all of the fingers down. We need to make sure that the ring finger here is kind of leading the motion, if you will. If the pinky's leading the way, you're gonna hear a run and not where you have a relatively clean, both of them coming up together. Let's give it a go. And just like that, you have the first three notes of the scale. Spend extra time, if you're a beginner and you're using this to help you learn the instrument, make sure before you move on to line two that you have that low G up to the B and back down super clean. What you wanna think about again, when you're on low G and going up, it's all about raising that ring finger and the pinky just kinda of comes along for the ride. And then on the way back down to get a good clean B back down to low G, that's where the pinky has to be maybe slightly more aggressive because if the ring finger comes down first, you're gonna hear that A. And we're not wanting that. That's clean. So once you have that under control and you can do all of those note changes and they sound good and clean, you're ready to move on to line two. Line two, we're gonna start on a C and we're gonna go straight down to low G. So we have two fingers moving together. Again, we want them both coming down smartly on the channer at the same time. We don't wanna hear a little run of the middle finger coming down first, but because the pinky is already down, this one tends to be pretty easy for most folks. And then next, we're gonna drop straight back down to that low G and we're gonna go all the way up to a D. Now watch my hand again. Watch my hand this angle. I actually have just a little bit of lateral or twisting motion going on. So I'm on low G, I'm here. When I go to lift to that D, the pinky's gonna stay down, but I don't just raise the fingers. I actually do just a very slight twist of my hand Boya, that knuckle is actually pivoting up. That really helps keep that clean. And not where I have runny fingers. By introducing just a little bit of motion in my wrist, it can really help clean everything up. And it's something I teach all of my beginners. And then finally, for the third bar, we're just gonna switch between C up to D and back down to C. But as you do that, I wanna make sure that your pointer finger is going higher than your middle finger. Not by a lot. I'm not trying to like wave high to my neighbors, but I'm on C. I'm going to raise to D and I'm again, just slightly twisting my wrist and making sure that that finger's getting higher and then back down to C. Let's turn this metronome on and give it a go. So again, practice that without a metronome at first, making sure that you get all the note changes cleanly and accurately. Add a metronome if you can. 
Try to get it in a good solid time. And when you can do that line and line one both clean and correct, we're ready to move on to line three. Now for line three, we're now going to start going to the top hand notes. But the top hand notes are interesting because the bottom hand is in a low A position. Now there's reasons for that that are beyond the scope of this video. But when we get to E, F, G, and high A, Notice the bottom hand is in this low A position, three down, one up, and it's going to stay that way. So as we kind of bounce around on these notes, the motion's all going to be on the top hand. We're going to start on A, going to E, lifting just the ring finger, and then back down. Then we're going up to an F, and again, we're going to want to make sure, if we can, trying to have that middle finger higher than the ring finger. It's really easy to go like this. But if you have your hand in that position with these fingers higher than the middle finger, you've probably had a run. You can hear that E in there, but if you're with that middle finger coming up a little bit higher, it tends to eliminate that run. And again, a run is where you hear the note in between. And we want to go straight from a low A to that F. Then we go from low A to high G. And again, I'm kind of moving my wrist a little bit, but this is going to be the squeezing arm of the bag. So it's a little harder to kind of get as much radial motion, if you will, into your wrist or arm. But again, for high G, we're going to want to make sure that we have that pointer finger higher than the other two. A lot of books say to have them even. I don't find that works very well. And when I watch, well, really great pipers, they don't have tend to have their fingers completely even. They tend to have a slight angle. Now, again, they're not way out here. Their fingers are pretty controlled. They're playing very quickly and very accurately. But they still tend to have the top more fingers higher off the channel than the lower ones. So we're on G. And again, if you end up here... See, my hand's like that, but you can hear that run going up. If I'm like I'm hinging that way with my hand, it tends to keep everything far cleaner. And then finally, we go from low A up to high A. Now for this one, the thumb needs to be the first guy off. We kind of want everything moving together, of course. But if the thumb is late, we're going to hear a high G or another note come out. We don't want that. We want that high A Low A, high A, nice and clean. And we do that by making sure that when we're going from low A to high A, that that thumb is kind of initiating the motion off the channer. And notice again, for high A, we have the ring finger down. Okay, with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn on the metronome and we're going to go and play low A to the notes of the top hand scale. As before, for a beginner, someone who's using this as a method to teach themselves, keep it clean. You want to make sure as you make these note changes that you don't hear any extra little fuzz or business between, say, A and F. You don't want... If you're hearing that, figure out what you're doing wrong. And what you're doing wrong is that this finger's coming up early and the middle finger's not leading the charge. So you're hearing an E, then the F, and then maybe on the way back down. We want to make sure that that middle finger is leading the way. Easiest to do by having it up first, and then back down. So keep it clean, and don't move on until you have this ready. A good solid foundation is what we're looking for, and proper fingering that's clean and, well, just well played is the best start we can have to making rich, full pipe music. Okay, the last part of the first step of this method before we learn any of the crosses, now we're going to go from low G to the top hand note. This is very similar to what we just did, but however, now the pinky is going to get involved as well. We need to make sure that the pinky is moving with the top hand notes. So when we're going from low G to E, we're not just lifting the ring finger here. We're, this guy's involved too. Low G to E. If the pinky comes up early, you can hear that low A creeps in there, and it doesn't sound very good. We want to go straight from low G to E. Let's go ahead and give this a go. Again, I'm going to use a metronome, but for the beginners out there, start by doing this with no metronome at all. Get through the note changes and make sure they're clean. Make sure there's no extra sounds or notes happening between any of these things. I would think for someone who's never picked up a, a channer before, this is a few hours of work already just by getting down to line four. Um, unless you have experience on other instruments, which if you do, that's fantastic. You might be able to do this in five or 10 minutes. If you've never played 
uh, uh, instrument that requires you covering holes with your fingers, this might take you a few hours just to get through line four cleanly, and that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. This is not a race. We want to make sure it's well done, well played, and that we're setting you up for success moving forward. <laughs> And with that, we've exhausted the notes we can play on our practice chanter that don't involve a cross. And when I say cross or crossing noise or any of those things, I'm very specific about what I'm talking about. Some pipers use the term crossing noise to describe any extraneous noise that occurs. And I don't find that useful because there are different noises and they have different causes. I've used the term run. What we've had to worry about so far in what we're doing are all about runs. And a run is when you're skipping a note, say going from A to F. Well, that's a big jump, but it only involves two fingers because of the nature of how we finger our instrument, A to F. But if you hear any sort of E between the A and the F, that's called a run, or at least that's what I call a run. We, we don't want that. That's what we're looking for, where there's just a very clean change of notes. And that's not easy. It's simple, and it's easy to think about. But simple and easy are not the same thing. In fact, most simple things are quite difficult. This just has holes. It's a very simple instrument in its construction. It's very difficult to learn how to play. And I appreciate all you guys that are wanting to pick it up. That's going to do it for this video today. We're going to limit it just to the lifting and lowering of the fingers and eliminating any runs that might be occurring. We're going to save crosses for the next video. The first edit of this came out to mm, roughly 42 minutes, and I thought that was a little much for one YouTube video. So we're going to take the crosses where we're lifting one finger, switching it while lowering another. That's going to be an entirely new video with separate exercises. Probably best to turn these into two separate things so we can really focus on getting our fingers clean and moving the way we need them to to make the kind of rich, powerful pipe music we want. Well, thank you so much for watching, everybody. If you got something out of this video, please like the video, comment below with any thoughts you might have, subscribe to the channel, and share with any pipers you think could get some use out of it. I am on Patreon for those that want to go the extra mile. As little as a dollar a month can go a long way to helping support the channel. There's a link below. Go ahead, head over there. There's sneak peeks and some exclusive content you might want to check out. I also give Skype lessons for those that want more personalized instruction. Go ahead and head over to www.mattpiper.com and you can get more information there. Thank you so much for watching, everybody. I'm Matt Willis Bagpiper, and until next time, cheers. Cheers.